to me, a radical innovator is, is someone who is not constrained by either the past or their own bias or even the current situation. And if you take a look at you know, a great book called The Innovator's Dilemma, they talk about how the more successful you are as an individual or as an organization, the harder it becomes to innovate because you end up disrupting yourself. So a radical innovator is somebody who is not afraid to disrupt their organization or even their own life um, in order to innovate and to improve. And this actually has its roots for me personally and for a lot of people in the Drupal community because up until Drupal 8, we as a community have been willing to completely break all backwards compatibility and throw everything out with every major revision in order to innovate. Again, it's been very painful and this experience, but it's because of that radical innovation and that willingness to take that pain that we've been able to continue to evolve and keep you know, our project, Drupal, relevant in the modern world, but also as individuals continue to expand our skills and our abilities to solve problems with uh, new technologies and new approaches. Uh, things have changed a lot. Um, you know, back in the olden days of the internet, a developer was somebody who typically knew how to write code, but was kind of like a jack of all trades. You kind of had to know a lot of things. And as technology has continued to advance, we've seen more people become more specialized and less um, generalized as is one big trend. So now you have a front end developer versus a back end developer versus a theme or designer versus a, um, you know, a decoupled, you know, et cetera. I think the largest hurdle that customers face is um, old mindsets, both for from the developer who is focused on building a specific application, as well as for the business who's focused on trying to do what they've always done. Um, it is the, it's the, it's not the technology that's the challenge, it's usually the approach and the mindset. Number one, who owns the experience? Because the owner of their experience, the person who's gonna, the team that's responsible, that's gonna get, you know, their butt handed to them because something goes wrong or something's screwed up, they're the one that makes the call on the assembly model, okay? Number two, there are three basic assembly models, high code, low code, and no code. They all have their pluses, they all have their minuses, they all have a place in the organization, but which one is the right one is almost always determined by point number one, which is who is uh, who owns the experience, who's responsible. Then you choose your assembly model, and then point three, the next most important thing is to look at how what are you trying to accomplish and how do you take that and break it into uh, modular components that can be reused to build not only the experience and the functionality you need today, but potentially other experiences in other environments or um, with other use cases later. The best way to get the most out of your developer team is to take as much off of their plate as you can i.e. look for um, things that other teams can do if they're properly empowered, look for things that um, the developers should not be focusing on, look for technologies and vendor partner solutions that can automate some or all of what the developer has to do for the, dairy, um, the care and feeding, because the more you can rely on low code tools to let the business side manage themselves, the more you can rely on partners and technology to do a lot of the work, the more of that valuable developer time that you can refocus on the really important critical things that no one else can solve but the developer. Better integrations, machine learning, um, automatic systems and processes, um, CICD, better testing, creating new types of functionality and components. You're never gonna be able to get over the innovation gap if you don't clear the runway to give the developer excess time to actually innovate. Drupal's always gonna have a strong developer tool set, not too worried about that, but really the big focus is on trying to provide 
more of those self-service tools, the site builder tools, more that we can do to kind of compete with some of those consumer CMSs like a Wix or a Squarespace, and ultimately lean on the, the power of open source to make those types of abilities and that technology available for you know anyone globally, regardless of their budget, regardless of their income. We're going to talk about lots of things. Uh, we're going to be talking about what's coming up on our roadmap as far as developer tools, which I'm very excited about. I can't say too much about right now, but it'll be impressive. Um, we're going to be talking about um, the dev.acquia.com site that we're rebuilding on top of Acquia CMS, how we did that, taking a look at some of the practical aspects, like how do we do migrations, what code did we use, what choice did we make and why. We're gonna be talking about the, the upcoming Acquia Marketplace and how that's gonna make, uh, hopefully make things easier for our customers. And we're also going to be um, talking about some of those other topics that you know we've covered with regards to um, the latest in decoupled, um, low code tools, how they fit and how to use those together. Those are some of the things we're gonna be talking about at Engage, should be good stuff. Uh, if you're a developer, you should go to Engage for a couple reasons. Um, the first one is that it's a good idea to kind of hear what's coming down um, the path from Acquia in terms of our products. And that's really kind of the best place to kind of get a sneak preview across all of our products, what's coming and what's next. Um, another good reason to go to Engage is because from the, uh, the partner stories, the customer stories, um, it's a really great way to hear what other people have done using the same tools you have where they've innovated, where they've been successful, lessons learned, right? Like what in hindsight, what could they have done better? It's a great way to kind of pick up some tips and learn from others who've actually implemented some of these things. And then the, the last piece is there's always some really good stuff going on with our, um, our demo booth. We have an innovation station. We have our um, product teams there. We have an entire developer track with things specific for developers as well as um, some other resources that some of our partners um, are putting out there. So typically I would say that, uh, you know, the Engage conference is, I'd say half for business and half for the tech side of the house. And there's plenty of good stuff there, good stuff to learn and um, a good way to make some of those connections too.